Would you like to say, would you like to say uh, you first something? <laughs> well, I, I think it might be better if we, if we began a conversation uh, rather than hold forth uh, in a lecture. But maybe I should say right away how grateful I am to the Fundation for the invitation to be here. What a pleasure it is to be in one of Europe's most beautiful cities. And, and how excited I am to have the chance to have a discussion with you about <laughs> such a, an inter interesting subject. So, Mira, let's I, start. I, I think let's we start. should have a conversation, not a lecture. Let's start. <clears throat> there are books to read and books to have. The square and the tower is the book to have and to read. To have because it should have a prominent place on the shelf of anybody. <laughs> to read for at least four reasons. The first one is that the square and the tower is, in some way, the book of books of Neil Ferguson. Because it includes knowledge of its previous books, like uh, the biography of the Henry Kissinger, like uh, Civilization, Empire, the First World War, the degeneration of <laughs> a great de 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 degeneration, the House of Rothschild, and, and so on. The second reason is that the book is an extraordinary lesson of applied history. We will talk about it later. Third, that the square and tower make sense of the present world, the world of two kinds of people, those who own and run the networks and those who use them. And for reason, the last one, but, uh, but not least, the book shows that trusting in networks to run the world is a recipe for anarchy. It is necessary to impose some kind of hierarchical order on the world. But let's start from the beginning. <laughs> Why we have to go to Siena for understanding the title of the book, the, the tower, the... <clears throat> uh, well, thank you, Mira, for... Uh, for such a lovely introduction, I'm very, I'm flattered. And apologies uh, that we have uh, an Italian piazza uh, instead of a, of a Spanish uh, plaza as the starting point. But there's a good reason. I was trying to find a title for this book that would be engaging, and I wasn't allowed to call it Networks, and hierarchies, because it was explained to me that very few television presenters in the United States would know what a hierarchy was. Uh, and so we had to come up with something snappier. And I was struggling with this. And then I looked up on the wall of my study and I saw two very, very cheap reproductions of the frescoes from the Palazzo Publico in Siena that I had bought when I was a poor graduate student many years ago. And I had taken them with me from Oxford to Cambridge to New York to, to Harvard and finally in Stanford, there they were. And suddenly I understood why I'd kept them all those years. Because it hit me that the title would be The Square and the Tower. Because there you have a perfect illustration in the center of Siena of the two concepts that I wanted to begin the book with. The public square, in this case the Piazza del Campo, is where the citizens of Siena networked. They met, exchanged goods, but also gossip. There was no structure to it, except maybe for the horse race known as the Palio, but that's pretty unstructured. And there, overshadowing it, it was the Torre del Manja, casting its shadow, as you see in this picture, a representation of hierarchical political order. And that dichotomy between social networks and, and structured hierarchies was the starting point of the book and also, also the title. 
I went back there, by the way, just before the publication of the book with my eldest son to check that I had not misremembered the frescoes. My, my reproductions were so bad that you almost couldn't make anything out. And I was just blown away by those extraordinary frescoes. They were far more vivid than I had remembered. And there were details that I'd forgotten. The little connecting thread between the citizens in the allegory of good government, they actually are a network. They're connected by a, a, a very scarcely visible thread. So it was thrilling to go back there and, and but, revisit but it. You are, you are much more guy of networks than of hierarchies. It's your confession, public yes. confession. Yes. But why did you write this book? Is there any more reason? <laughs> uh, the answer to that question, in fact, leads back to a previous book, uh, the biography that I am halfway through uh, of Henry Kissinger. At the end of finishing the first volume, I had got Henry Kissinger from being a refugee from Nazi Germany to being appointed national security advisor by Richard Nixon. And I finished and thought, how on earth am I going to write volume two? How do I explain to readers how a Harvard professor, which was all he was at the end of 1968, became, within just a few years, the most powerful man after the president in the United States, and during the crisis of Watergate and the transition to Gerald Ford's presidency, arguably the most powerful man in the world. And I, thought, I sort of thought to myself, you know, it can't just be attributed to intellectual firepower, and you can't just attribute it to some kind of scheming Machiavellian personality, which is what Walter Isaacson argues in his book. And it suddenly hit me that the answer might be Kissinger's network. So the hypothesis, here it is, <laughs> the hypothesis of volume two, which I haven't yet written, is that the key to Kissinger's rise was not just his intellect, but his extraordinary ability to build a network that extended beyond the White House, beyond indeed Washington DC, extended into the media, and of course into multiple foreign countries. So the Kissinger network was an idea. But then I paused and I, I thought to myself, I don't think I can write that yet because I don't really understand networks as well as I should. I've been writing about them for years, but very casually. I'd written a book about the Rothschild family and its banking business, which talks about networks, but very informally. Now, I'd just moved to Stanford. And I had the opportunity to spend time with the people building the biggest networks in history, Facebook, Google, and so forth. And to talk to people who've spent their lives studying networks, economists, uh, sociologists, also people who study neural networks, the, the scientists who work on networks. So I decided I would educate myself about networks, understand how they operate, before I could begin to write the history of this particular network. And the square in the tower in that sense is a crash course in network science applied to me and then translated into the realm of history. I like your idea, Mira, that it's a kind of book of books. It is a summation. You could have been cruel and said it's Neil Ferguson's greatest hits. Um, <laughs> but I think it worked quite well for me to look back on some earlier work and rethink it using the new conceptual framework that I'd learned from my colleagues in other fields. In some ways, it's a new interpretation of history and how to learn history also. It's, in some way, I, I see it like a proposal to yes. how to study history, because we always think about the kings, about the empires, about the, 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 the people who won the wars and, and conquest, conquestors, but we usually don't think about the networks and the like normal people. No, you... That's right, and this was a kind of um, refinement of the long-standing call of social historians and, and others to study 
marginalized groups. My sense is that we, we need to be more precise than to study the working class, uh, or for that matter, to stop looking at men and only look at women, which is another approach that's been fashionable. And my, my response was, let's not be so uh, unsophisticated. Let's understand that if we're going to study uh, beyond the realm of power, the activities of, of people, the best way to do that is through the lens of network analysis. That no man is an island. Uh, people are connected. And we now have a, a conceptual toolkit that allows us to analyze social networks and see how the great ideas of the past were transmitted. This is a really important part of the book, showing that only by analyzing network structure can we understand intellectual and political revolutions. So I do think it's a manifesto for a different approach to history. There are historians already doing this kind of work, but they're rather isolated from one another and working on little bits and pieces of the past. The Square in the Tower tries to bring all that different work together into some kind of synthetic whole. Yeah. But it's a good moment to, to make a question about the applied history. Mm. Just back a little bit to, to Kissinger. In, in 1973, the Kissinger was the, the most uh, connected man of the world, but also he was and he is an extraordinary historian. He said that history is not a cookbook offering pre-tasted pre recipes. It teaches by analog analogy, not by maxims. History can illuminate the consequences of actions in comparable situations. Give it a little bit more to us about the, the applied history, because I, I think that one of the, the, the heart of the book is the applied history, the book of books, <laughs> your books and the applied history. I understand it in, in this way. Well, Mira, I think you and I agree that the study of history is not an antiquarian pursuit. We don't study the past because it's interesting in and of itself. We study the past because we want to understand the present better and we want to have some sense of plausible futures that lie ahead. Now. This is not especially uh, fashionable in academic uh, circles, where I was taught uh, at Oxford in the 1980s that lessons of the past were the kind of things that journalists tried to find, and serious academic historians weren't so jejeune. But in fact, it's always struck me as silly not to look for lessons from the past. The question is, how do we go about that in a rigorous way, because if we don't do it rigorously, then we end up with what I'll call the, the, the popular version of applied history, in which every crisis ends up being compared to the 1930s. Uh, th this is a very common problem amongst uh, politicians who are always trying to draw analogies with the 1930s without really ever having studied it very seriously. And I'm really tired uh, at this point of bad analogies between whatever happens in our time and the 1930s. It's always the Great Depression again, or the rise of Hitler again, or the rise of fascism again. And I try to make the point in this book that that is absolutely the wrong place to look for analogies for our own time. We are very, very far removed from the 1930s, and it serves very little purpose to seek analogies in that period. Writing the first volume of Kissinger's biography, it struck me that he himself is an applied historian, that he's one of those rare people who's entered the realm of power with a very well-developed understanding of history beforehand. Unfortunately, most people in the realm of power have not studied history at all. There are very few historians. If you go to Washington, D.C., they're a rarity. And I'm afraid the same is true in most European cities. The result is that we, by and large, make policy in a haze of amnesia. When I was writing uh, about the Vietnam uh, experience that Kissinger had in the 1960s when he first visited Vietnam, I described 
why the American intervention was going very wrong in the late 1960s. Somebody who read the book, who had served in the administration of George W. Bush, wrote to me and said how much he had enjoyed the book. And he added, I was very struck by how similar your descriptions of Vietnam in the 1960s were to our experience in Iraq after 2003, as if this was a great revelation. Whereas to an historian, and I'd written a book called Colossus about this, it was perfectly obvious that the United States was about to repeat all the mistakes that it had made in Vietnam in the different setting of Iraq. Applied history, I think above all, is about the correct use and careful use of analogy. Knowing what it's appropriate to compare something with is an absolutely crucial skill that one has to learn. And I think that we as historians do not do nearly enough uh, in our jobs as teachers to teach our students how to make those correct analogies. We do not spend enough time as historians connecting the past to the present and helping our students understand the present in historical terms. Because we don't do it, it gets done by journalists and it gets done by politicians and generally speaking, it gets done very badly. You argue that the impact of internet has the best analogy with the impact of printing of 16th century Europe. What are the major differences between our network age and the era that followed the advent of European printing? I mean, the difference between Gutenberg and Zuckerberg. <laughs> well, one important difference is that Johannes Gutenberg did not become a billionaire. Uh, First it, one. <laughs> it, it, in fact, he, he, he went bankrupt at one point and, and died uh, living on a state pension. There's a reason for that, which I'll come to in a minute. But the first point I want to make is that this is the right analogy for understanding our time. That the impact of the personal computer and the internet uh, is very similar to the impact of the printing press 500 or so years ago. Why? Because unlike the communication technologies of the intervening period, the telegraph, the telephone, the radio, the cinema, and the television. These technologies allowed a highly decentralized form of communication to flourish. The intervening technologies of the Industrial Revolution were naturally easy to centralize. Central control came very easily when the telegraph came into being. The same was true of railroads. The same was true of telephones, of radio, of cinema, and of television. Uh, and so for a very long period in history, really stretching from the early 19th century to the 1970s, it was possible for governments to control the means of communication if they chose to completely. Think only of the control exercised by Stalin uh, or Hitler or Mao. Uh, this is only really possible in one remaining country today, North Korea, and it's extremely difficult for the North Koreans to maintain any uh, com a complete exclusion of the internet from, from their, their country. So the real analogy we should look at is not with the 1930s, forget all that. The right analogy is with the early 16th century and the 17th century, when the printing press began radically to alter the public sphere in Europe, so that for the first time, ideas like Luther's ideas for the reform of the Roman Catholic Church could be transmitted very rapidly uh, throughout Europe, very cheaply and in great quantities. Uh, it's very fascinating that the impact of the new technology on the cost of content and the volume of content is almost exactly the same in the two cases. It's just that the personal computer and the internet have an exponential impact on the volume of content and dramatically reduce the cost of content in a much shorter time frame. The big difference between our time and that time is that everything happens 10 times faster in our time. So what took 100 years in the 16th and 17th century takes 10 years in our time. But in other respects, it's quite similar. There are other similarities too, I'll be very 
brief about them. Um, for example, everybody at the beginning of the Reformation, certainly Luther and his, and his confederates, expected a positive outcome from creating uh, a print-based, uh, modernized Christianity. Everybody was going to be able to read the Bible themselves and have a direct relationship to God. It was going to be great. There was going to be a priesthood of all believers. That was the vision. And this reminds me very much of Mark Zuckerberg's vision that with Facebook, we would all be connected in the global community and everything would be awesome. Except it didn't turn out that way then and it hasn't turned out that way now. Because then as now, when you create large social networks, they don't form a happy, clappy global community. Actually, what happens is that they get polarized very quickly into hostile clusters. That's what happened in the Reformation. Half of Europe agreed with Luther, people like me from Scotland, and the other half, people like you, thought he was a heretic and should be burnt at the stake. And for 130 years, a religious war raged in Europe within states and between states, this was not what Luther had expected, nor did he expect that the printing press would communicate not only good ideas like the content of the Bible, but really terrible ideas like the idea that witches live amongst us, an idea that spread very rapidly thanks to the printing press in Protestant countries and led to an epidemic of witch burning in countries precisely like mine. Scotland burnt thousands of women as witches. Uh, so. What I think we can learn from this analogy is that if you create new and very large networks exploiting new technology, we should not expect an easy or happy outcome. We should expect there to be polarization. We should expect there to be crazy stuff that goes viral. Network science makes predictions like that, but I think also an analogy with the period of the Reformation helps one make predictions like that. And I think by thinking this way about our present circumstances, we should be less surprised by some of the stuff that is going on in the world today. The polarization, the fake news going viral. We've seen these things before, albeit with a, a somewhat simpler technology, and albeit at a much slower pace. One last point, which brings me to why Mark Zuckerberg is a billionaire and Gutenberg wasn't. A big difference between our time and that time is that nobody ever really established centrally controlling platforms on top of printing. Printing remained decentralized. It's still pretty decentralized, despite the efforts of a few media tycoons to centralize the newspaper business. The truth is that even Rupert Murdoch never achieved that big a market share of the whole universe of print. Printing has remained a distributed, decentralized technology to a remarkable extent. And that's not true of the internet, because in a really short space of time, we went from a very decentralized World Wide Web to one dominated by a handful of network platforms, one of which is Facebook, the others, of course, are Google, and Amazon, and Apple to some extent too. So a big difference is that in our time, we went really quickly from a decentralized distributed network to something far more hierarchical in which power and ownership of the network has been concentrated in a very few and very rich hands. Inequality, so is one of, of also of, of uh, the huge inequality. Right. We are much more connected than ever, but also the inequality in some way is, is in some respect, and quality uh, is, is, uh, is very present. Well, we were told, central. weren't we? We were all going to be netizens, and we were all going to be equally connected. We would all have our own blogs, and it would be a flat world. Remember the flat world? But some of us will be much richer than... <laughs> well, it turns out that the very opposite happens if you create giant networks. And this was a really important point I learned from the physicist Laszlo Barabasi. Uh, Barabasi shows that if you just look at the physics of networks, uh, it's actually really unlikely that a large social network will be in any way egalitarian. 
because of the phenomenon of preferential attachment, when a new node joins the network, it wants to be connected to the most connected nodes. And, and this is a really important idea that has implications for our social networks today. When you decide, if you do decide, to join Twitter, uh, you don't follow Neil Ferguson, you follow Donald Trump. Uh, you, you go follow the people who already have an enormous number of followers. So there's an inherent inegalitarian quality to large social networks, uh, just in terms of the sheer distribution of followers. But of course, the real inequality, the financial inequality, comes from the fact that most of us are just users, whereas uh, the thing to be is an owner. You want to own the network platforms. You want to have equity in those companies. If you were smart, you did that. If you were dumb, <laughs> you just gave them your data for free and thought naively, how wonderful, this product is free. But remember, if the product is free, um, you are the product. <laughs> in today's terms, the hierarchy is the nation state itself. The tower is the nation state itself. And you, you argue that one of the main threats to the hierarchical world order is evolution of the network itself. We are between a rock and a hard place in, in two senses. Um, on the one side, we have seen in Britain and the United States presidential elections the threat that networks of political complexity pose to the nation state, which is the main pillar of the world order. And for the other side, uh, we still don't know how far the networks of economic complexity possess threat to the hierarchical world order of nation states. But let's talk about the American elections, <laughs> because we will, next November, uh, United States will celebrate the midterm elections, but uh, in one occasion you said that no Facebook, no Trump. Uh, we know more or less the, the history, we know about the third man, I mean about the Putin, <laughs> about the, the Russian uh, inherence, but also we know the Brexit case. The Brexit case was a victory of network over the hierarchy of the British establishment. In some way Trump also uh, is the victory of the networks over the America, or first of all of the Republican Party. <laughs> establishment and then of the United, uh, United States. Uh, even in 2010 was formally demonstrated that the networks are a very powerful instrument and in political uh, organize, organization. So, but really, what did happen in 2006? Uh, it's only a question of Facebook and Trump. Uh, Trump, who is tweeting all the time, with six, his 16 Coca-Colas daily, with his uh, huge button, much bigger than of the Kim Jong-un soon, and so on. I mean, uh, what really happened in 2016? Because all people, all my friends in the United States said, Oh yes, but it's impossible that Trump will not, will not, it could not won because Hillary is the woman, is the white, is, is like, uh, it was like unimaginable for European people. All Europeans uh, prefer Hillary, of course. And what really did happen in the United States in November 2016? Well, I'm glad to say that the book offers, I think, a pretty good answer to that question. I that. Uh, and, and part of what inspired me to write it was watching this unfolding crisis, uh, a crisis that caught most professors at Harvard and Stanford completely by surprise, especially the ones who were experts in political science, who were convinced that Hillary Clinton would be president. I think the simplest answer I can give you is that the technology uh, made possible by Facebook, uh, as well as by Twitter and, and Google, was much less well understood by the Democrats than they thought. 
You see, they thought it was theirs because Obama had used it. We have uh, another. Ah, yes, this is one of my favorite charts from the book. So what this chart tells you is the number of followers that uh, the candidates had in 2008 and 2016 on Twitter uh, and Facebook. And there are two things to observe, really, here. Uh, one is that although Twitter and Facebook were a part of the story in 2008, they were tiny at that time. And while it was very cool that Obama used those uh, network platforms, it's impossible to claim that they had a decisive impact on the election because too few people were using them. But you fast forward uh, to the election of 2016 and the scale of the networks is vastly greater. And my second point, Trump dominated Clinton on both. He had substantially more followers on both Twitter and Facebook uh, than Hillary Clinton. Now, when I saw those numbers in the middle of the 2016 election, I remember thinking, bloody hell. That's completely at odds with the opinion poll data. I wonder what else I can find out about the role of uh, social media in this election. So I looked at Google searches. Donald Trump was searched for far more than Hillary Clinton, just in raw numbers of searches. He was ahead of her in every state, including states like New York, California, Massachusetts, that you think of as being democratic states. So I began to think that there might be some real significance now to the role that these network platforms were playing. I began to dig, and I began to find out a number of very disturbing things. The first disturbing thing was that the Russians were clearly using, uh, in some ways, the technology to influence the election. One obvious way was hacking uh, into the democratic uh, email accounts and then distributing the emails at strategic moments uh, via WikiLeaks. But there was other stuff going on that was strange, like Russian content began to appear in Trump's speeches. A fake news story from Sputnik actually cropped up in a Trump speech. I noticed it and thought, hello, that's odd. And a lot of uh, other things were going on that are only gradually emerging into the light of day. The most important of these was that the Trump campaign was using Facebook advertising systematically to target voters, and the Clinton campaign wasn't. The Clinton campaign declined when Facebook offered to send engineers to work with it to hone its use of advertising. The Trump campaign did not decline. On the contrary, it worked very closely with Facebook to make sure that its advertising was hitting the selected targets. One reason I was aware of the fact that Trump might win by later in the election campaign was Brexit, because Brexit was a dress rehearsal in which the very same techniques I'm describing were used successfully by the Leave campaign, especially Facebook advertising. And Facebook advertising is the most powerful tool in democracy today. It's very cheap and it's precisely targeted at you, the individual voter, because Facebook has the data. And it can make sure that if you want, as a campaign, to send a message to African-American voters in certain key states to discourage them from voting for Hillary Clinton, you can do that. And it's cheap. It's quite amazingly cheap. From the point of view of the Trump campaign and the Leave campaign in Britain, this was vital because they had less resources than the establishment. But the established hierarchies, David Cameron's, in Britain, Hillary Clinton's in the United States were complacent. They were confident that they would win, and they didn't appreciate that the game had changed. In fact, what was so funny was the conviction in both Silicon Valley and in the Hillary Clinton campaign that she would win. The, the companies and the wealthy elites in Silicon Valley overwhelmingly contributed to Clinton's campaign. And she did fundraisers there, so she just assumed it was all on her side. Imagine! The scene on the morning of November the 9th, 2016, at the headquarters of Google, 
and Facebook. You don't need to imagine the scene at Google because there's now a video recording of what they were saying. And what they were saying was, oh my God. They were appalled because their attempts to help Clinton, basically they had rigged search so that when you typed in Hillary Clinton, it suggested things like, will be a great president. And it hadn't worked. So they were really shocked because they'd failed. But the shock at Facebook was far worse because they realized that they had helped Trump and it had worked. They had unwittingly elected Donald Trump as president. And this sent the organization into deep shock uh, so that when uh, allegations began to be made, for example, about Russian interference, Mark Zuckerberg's initial reaction was to dismiss it as a crazy idea. Well, it wasn't a crazy idea. It turned out that the number of people who saw Russian content on Facebook was roughly the same as the number of people who voted. So I think we are dealing here with a transformation in the nature of the democratic process which is as dramatic as the way that printing transformed the public sphere in the 16th century. And we are still, I think, not getting our heads around it because it's just so weird. I mean, it's just so hard to imagine that things could have changed so much between 2008 and 2016. And this changes the cyberspace is a new underground of Fyodor Dostoevsky. Right. Just to follow the same line, are the big Silicon Valley companies our new diamonds, idiots, gamblers, doubles, and so on. Many titles of novels of, of Dostoevsky. I, I actually, I mean, you know, it's funny you should say are, that. <laughs> yeah, but uh, they are really contribute to huge development also. But on the other side, they are enemies. I mean, uh, of democracy. Number one, Dostoevsky is very well worth reading, and especially notes from underground. <laughs> I'm writing an article along paper at the moment entitled What is to be done? A rather Russian title uh, for the piece. Very Leninist. Um, although actually it wasn't Lenin who originally used it. It was Chernyshevsky and Lenin's and Lenin, yeah. um, But the epigraph is from Notes from Underground because in Notes from Underground Dostoevsky heaps scorn on the idea of a utilitarian future in which everything will be planned and all actions will be predicted. It's actually a perfect description of the artificial intelligence world that we're being guided towards uh, by Google, Facebook, Amazon, and the rest. Uh, except that this is a far more uh, scientifically plausible world than the world of the 19th century utilitarians and, and socialist utopians. And Dostoevsky says, and I'm with Dostoevsky all the way, no, no matter how much you try to plan uh, our every action and predict our every response, the individual human being will assert his right to be stupid. Uh, <laughs> and I, I love that quotation because that's exactly my response to artificial intelligence, big data, and network platforms that want to predict what I'm going to go and buy next. I really have an overwhelming desire to revolt against the machine. So that's part... Uh, part one of the answer. Part two of the answer is that we cannot leave things as they are. Right now, 80% of Americans get their news via either Google or Facebook. They don't go straight to the New York Times website. They read the stories that the Facebook news feed suggests or Google search suggests. 80%. This gives Facebook and Google more power than any publisher in the history of publishing. Vastly more power than William Randolph Hearst had at the height of his uh, power as a newspaper baron. And at the moment, they're more or less completely unregulated. And we can't possibly leave things in that state. Uh, a, it's gradually destroying traditional publishing because these companies make all the money uh, out of the advertising uh, and don't pay for the content. Uh, uh, but, but it's also profoundly destabilizing to democracy. And by the way, nothing has really changed since 2016. Very little has actually changed. And so we can expect similar phenomena in November of this year. Uh, probably more subtle, because the Russians know uh, what they can't do twice. But there will be more, and it will be disruptive. And by the way, the technology of faking 
content, faking video content in particular, is a lot better now than it was two years ago. So the fake news is going to get much, much more persuasive in terms of its plausibility. And that, I think, is a big worry. But what do you think? Is it possible the story, some like, uh, then come the porn star and save America? Or <laughs> all the Russians will <laughs> continue to well, interfere? Uh, or right. uh, of the Democrats could uh, win? Or how do you see it? Well, anybody who, makes, <laughs> anybody who makes predictions about American politics these days is uh, very, very unwise to be overconfident. I think that it's quite likely the Democrats will win back the House. I think it's quite likely that they will impeach Donald Trump because the left wing of the Democratic Party is thirsting to do that, even although the leadership doesn't want to. I think that it is perfectly plausible that Robert Mueller will publish a report at some point this year with pretty damning evidence that the Trump campaign did collude with the Russians. I think none of this will, in fact, bring Donald Trump down because, in fact, uh, his popularity might even rally in the face of impeachment. And uh, that's certainly what happened to Bill Clinton. I, I therefore have a sense that the Democrats could win a Pyrrhic victory uh, this year, only to lose in 2020. Uh, I can't even begin to, to imagine how many candidates there will be for the Democratic nomination, more than 30 at this point. And that will therefore be a complete circus. And out of that race, who knows who will emerge? Uh, I don't think it will be Stormy Daniels, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't <laughs> yeah, want to be 100% certain of that. It's, uh, it's crazy town, to use a phrase that's currently uh, popular thanks to Bob Woodward's book. But it's not, I think, guaranteed that the Trump presidency ends the way so many journalists want it to end in a rerun of Watergate. It's not the 1930s, and it's not the 1970s either. And I have a sense that uh, we should be very, very wary of underestimating the capacity of Trump and Trumpism to withstand uh, what are bound to be some very difficult months. By the way, the storm he has to worry about right now is not... Stormy Daniels. It's the storm that's bearing down on the eastern seaboard of the United States, which uh, is shaping up to deliver the Hurricane Katrina of his presidency. And uh, I think that could be a major, major challenge to Trump's, uh, Trump's administration. We, we will read your paper about what can be done, but can a network, networked world have order? I think not. I mean, I, I you, think... You, I know that you doubt it. Why? Well, Why? I, I read a book while I was researching The Square and the Tower by Anne-Marie Slaughter, uh, who served for a time in the Obama administration. And in this book, she argues that we should make the international order more like a kind of network. And we should actually weaken institutions like the United Nations Security Council or add new members... Uh, new permanent members to that body. And she has a kind of enthusiasm uh, for networked organizations that I am deeply suspicious of. Um, I think if you tried to run the world uh, on Facebook, we would very rapidly uh, plunge into a new 30 years war. I strongly oppose this line of argument and in the end phase of the book, argue that we, in fact, need to strengthen the hierarchical elements in the international system. And I'll, I'll draw a brief analogy, and, and then maybe we can open it up to the audience. My analogy is with, uh, actually, Henry Kissinger's first book, A World Restored, in which he argued that the reason that Europe had peace from 1815 to 1914 was that the five great powers had successfully built a legitimate order in the post-Napoleonic period. And uh, this is not a controversial view. Most historians would probably agree with that account. It was a, a kind of unfair arrangement because if you weren't one of the five great powers and Spain wasn't, then you were essentially a second-class power. And the decisions taken uh, by England, France, Prussia, Austria, and Russia 
were binding on you and they reserved the right to intervene uh, and did indeed intervene in Spain's affairs and Italy's affairs uh, if they saw any revolutionary threat to this new order. Well, whether you liked it or not, it worked remarkably well and the 19th century was a lot more peaceful in Europe than the 18th century and a hell of a lot more peaceful than the 20th century. So in the end, I say, look, we actually have a legitimate world order already. There are five great powers which have a privileged status. They're the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. And what we in fact need to do if we're going to have any kind of order in this crazy networked world, is get them to work together more effectively. An example, a major source of instability in cyberspace, as we've already mentioned, is Russia, one of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. In my view, cyber warfare will be con continuous and escalating unless the Russians can be persuaded to sign up to some kind of convention limiting cyber warfare in the same way that in the past we had conventions to limit biological and chemical weapons. There is no deterrence in cyberspace. It's not like nuclear strategy. Uh, and looking for a deterrence theory in cyberspace is futile. So my hope is that we can make, and this was something I argued for at the end of 2016, make it a goal of uh, US uh, policy, but also of European policy, to strengthen the UN Security Council, as, for example, we saw over North Korea, and force the Russians into the fold. There's a terribly crude expression that I'm going to use now, and I hope that the members of the, uh, the Del Pino family will forgive me. It's been sometimes said of Russia, and I said it myself a few months ago, that Russia can't decide if it's part of the order or if it's a revolutionary power. Sometimes Russia, and here's the crude part, is inside the tent pissing out, and sometimes it's outside the tent pissing in, but it's always pissing. But always pissing. <laughs> That, that is the truth. <laughs> and, and that's the thing that is most destabilizing of international order at the moment. You, you used a phrase, Mira, which I want to maybe end with before we go to the audience, between a rock and a hard place. Europe is between a rock and a hard place in terms of the, the networked world because Europe has no big technology companies. The big technology companies are either the FANG companies in the United States or the BAT, BAT companies in China. There's nothing really in Europe worth talking about. And that means that as these network platforms grow, and they are still growing, and gradually cover the entire surface of the world, Europe is not going to be in a strong position to determine how they behave. Uh, and that is a big problem for this, for this part of the world. Yeah. Before I give the floor to the audience, uh, just the last, last question. You mentioned the, the cyber war. And uh, when networks are very, very good in creativity, inventions, but what do happen when we comes to security and defense? I, just one question, because I, I cannot resist to, to ask you about the book of your wife, of the brilliant mm. author Ayan Hirsi Ali. He, uh, her last book, The Challenge of Dawa, explains that the K of uh, Islamic terrorism is not, at least not only the, the concept of jihadism, but even more important is the concept of Dawa, the concept of the, of the political uh, Islam, of uh, the, the ideology of, of yeah. the political uh, Islam, and, uh, uh, and, and an instrument of radicalization. So, you are expert in networks, she's expert in Dawa, just uh, try to link it, I mean, uh, what is the role of networks in the radicalization and, of course, uh, as a, uh, radicalization an instrument in uh, the Islamic terrorism? I, I think that is one of the, the biggest threat of, of, the, of the, our time and uh, we will have the, the problem for a long time. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Ayan. Uh, my, my wife is much more interesting than me. Uh, he's and, more uh, she's, she's more much beautiful. She's more beautiful. But we uh, don't know. That's for sure. But she's also much braver. I'm sure if she were here tonight, the, 
there would be standing room only, but there would also have to be security because of the threats to her life from, uh, uh, from jihadists that date back all the way to 2004 when Theo van Gogh was murdered in Amsterdam, when Ayan was working with him. Ayan has been an extraordinarily courageous voice since 9-11, arguing that we need to understand the threat of political Islam, not uh, pretend that there is no religious content to it, but understand what motivates people to fly planes into tar blocks. And it's not that they're resentful of American foreign policy in the Middle East. Uh, so Ayan's argument has long been that the ideology of political Islam or radical Islam, if you want to call it that, poses a fundamental threat to the values of Western uh, open societies on a whole range of fronts. Uh, not the least of which is uh, our assumption that men and women should be equal. That is not how Sharia law regards the relationship between the sexes. Uh, and it's not the case that political Islam accepts our distinction between church and state, because there is no distinction between the religious and the political in Islam. Where Ayan and I began to join forces intellectually was that I was working on networks and she was working on non-violent extremism, dawa. This is the, um, the way in which a radical ideology is transmitted. And we realized that we were essentially thinking along the same lines. The reason that terrorists commit acts of violence is that there's been a period of preparation, a period you might call it of brainwashing or of proselytizing, and all over Europe, and indeed in North America, all around the world, there are networks of Islamic centers and mosques run by radical clergy that are spreading uh, an extremist version uh, of Sunni Islam. Uh, and it's not until you've spent some time in that milieu that your thoughts turn to jihad. You start, in other words, with dawah, which is nonviolent, radical proselytization, and then later come comes jihad. Now, we in the West, since 9-11, have thought that we were fighting against a tactic, terrorism, and we've engaged in essentially military or security-based responses to terrorism. We've consistently tried to play down the ideological or religious dimension with the mantra, Islam is a religion of peace, that all world leaders had to keep uttering over and over again throughout the last 17 years. Uh, and as we have done this, we've completely neglected to counter the rapid spread of the network of Dawah, supported by public and private funding from the Gulf states, and spreading rapidly, not only in the West, but everywhere, not least in, in Africa these days. So that is a huge security problem for the future, and we haven't yet figured out how to counter the spread of this particular network. So network science is actually a powerful tool for understanding this particular security threat. But I think until we properly understand the threat itself, by reading my wife's work, we won't yeah, really know what yeah. to do with network science. No, I recommend it. it really.